Uh, first of all, Happy New Year uh, from the Coventry Society to everyone that's joined us and indeed for everyone that hasn't. Let's hope it's a better one this year than it was last year. Uh, for, for, for this, which is our first meeting in 2021, uh, we've got one of our Coventry Society members, uh, James Rose, is going to tell us about the research of, uh, which is done into the uh, black and white mural at the uh, Charterhouse. Uh, James has been researching and studying the mural since uh, he mural since he attended uh, an uh, open day at the Charter House shortly after he retired to Coventry nearly four years ago. So I, I, I guess you know we hereby confer, confer on him the status of Coventry kid. Oh, thank uh, you. His <laughs> gong will follow. Uh, <laughs> His talk will uh, interpret the meaning of the decoration and the associated inscription, uh, which both shed light on the people and the politics of the period uh, in which it was created. Um, James used to be a GP and a gastroenterologist. How about that? I, I knew I thought I'd screw up on that, but there you go. Um, a profession much involved in interpreting the meaning of patient stories. So. I'm not going to say any more because I'm really looking forward to this. So uh, over to you, James. Uh, thank you. I, um, I, I'd like to claim to be a, a, a GP at some stage because they're proper generalists, but uh, I was confined to the hospital as a, as a consultant, uh, but that's irrelevant. So anyway, good, good evening, uh, fellow Coventry Society members uh, and any members of the Charterhouse Association uh, who have been able to, to join us. Uh, as Vincent said, but he's told you what I'm going to talk about, but my only preamble is essentially uh, that being relatively new to Coventry, even if I've just been, as it were, christened, um, uh, some of the history and some of the mythology will be well known to some of you, although not to me, uh, and maybe it'll be quite nice uh, if I just go through it because it helps me understand what's been going on. So I'm now going to share screen uh, and do my presentation. Um, and I'm hoping that this is going to work nicely. Um, right, okay. Uh, I'm also going to, uh, I was going to try and turn off my video as well, uh, rather than having me, um, excuse me, just uh, I'll take that off, and put that on again and right, there we go. I have to, try and uh, uh, get John and Vincent out of the way but if if, if uh, everyone else can see that that's fine. So this is the uh, about the black and white painting uh, and inscription in the charter house uh, and um, yeah this is where the first thing goes on where the remote suddenly stops uh, working uh, and I have difficulty advancing the oh there we go it's got working now. So this is the charter house of you you will know well uh, found in 1385 by Richard II and Anne of Bohemia. Uh, and what we see here is the refectory and the prior's house, which was completed in 1435. And then the rest of the monastic buildings fell victim to uh, the dissolution of the monasteries in 1539. Uh, and uh, 30 years later, uh, Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester, bought the charter house. And as you can see, he's a fine figure of a man. Um, this is an interesting painting. Um, uh, and uh, I, I think as with a lot of Elizabethan paintings, there's a lot hidden in it. There's a dog there, which to me suggests faithfulness. Uh, and he's handling uh, a, a handkerchief uh, in his pocket, um, which may allude to some favor that the queen uh, did him, which led to a bit of a bust up with the Duke of Norfolk, but that's a whole different story. Uh, but the refectory being a very big barn of a building, uh, he, in order to make it a domestic possibility, he inserted two floors uh, to give him two extra stories, and these had partitions in them. And it was believed that the painting we're going to discuss uh, belongs, which is on one of the um, <clears throat> one of the partitions, uh, was was. Um, painted on the wall between 1569 and 1572 when he sold the charter house. Uh, and this is the painting. I don't know how many of you have seen it, but uh, it is undoubtedly striking, despite the fact that it's had um, doors punched in it and so on. 
Uh, I mean, it goes uh, currently wall to wall and floor to ceiling. And as you can see, it's got a, a number of interesting features, uh, which I will go through. So the main elements are the, the, the painting is on a partition wall uh, and the coat of arms, which is currently hidden behind the icon of me, uh, and I hope isn't on your screens, uh, is of a subsequent owner, uh, Samson Baker, and it was overpainted sometime after 1572. And we all love to know what's actually painted underneath. I imagine with modern technology, maybe there's a way of finding out. Uh, it's a black and white painting, as you can see, and not grisaille. I mention this because it says grisaille uh, pretty well everywhere else. And I was seriously hauled over the coals by one of the reviewers of my, paint, of my paper about this. And I had to eventually agree that it was black and white and not grisaille, which is just various shades of gray. Uh, the style with all the uh, curly foliage and fantastic animals and all the rest of it uh, is uh, antique, uh, um, as it was called then, or grotesque, as we now uh, tend to call it. And I'll talk a bit about that later. And then just above the door to the right, there's a religious inscription, uh, the interpretation of which will uh, follow after, uh, in the last sort of third of the you know, quarter of the, of the talk. And then you can see to the uh, left of the white panel door, a naked winged figure uh, standing on a marine creature. Uh, and I'm hoping that you've got full screen uh, and can see an armored man in an alcove um, uh, to the right of the door. Uh, and then there's a horse uh, with, a, with wings and a sort of fishy tail, which is called a hippocamp. Uh, and is a fantastical creature, obviously. And then just to the right of the uh, main wooden door, there's an elaborate column with some decorative features. Uh, and you can see that to the left of that column, to the right of the column, it's fairly symmetrical, um, although we don't have what, what is behind or what may have been behind the door. But if you look at the top freeze part, you can see that they are mirror images of each other. Uh, and then uh, around the place, there are sundry other winged and other mythical beasts and various vases and so on. And, and that's the sort of the main elements uh, of the painting. Um, and although it is a rare survival, it is not actually unique. Um, I mean, this is in the Gloucester Folk Museum, fairly contemporary. Um, uh, you can see um, faces attached to strange things, um, uh, weird uh, beasties here is what my mother used to call growly wows, which I think describes a lot of these beasts very well. Um, uh, and then this is Acton Hall in Gloucestershire, um, a building that bears a striking resemblance to the Charter House, I would say, and it has uh, paintings inside, uh, which interestingly were done for the procession, I think it's procession or precession uh, of Elizabeth I as she went round the country staying at great expense with all the lords and important people like that. Uh, and you can see that here uh, there is a frieze, more details over here, fantastic beast vases and so on, and they generally tended to be uh, above wainscoting or, or um, uh, wall hangings of some sort or another. Uh, and this is a, a, another one really quite similar in many ways uh, from Polstead Hall in Suffolk, quite contemporary. Uh, and here you see this sort of frieze-like element across the top. And then you have the central column here. And then to right and left, mirror images. Uh, and these were uh, nearly all taken from Italian uh, pattern books that, that came over after the um, popularity of the grotesque style. Uh, so what is the grotesque style? Well, uh, it's named after Nero's palace, the Golden House, the Domus Aureus in Rome. Uh, and Nero, um, once he was safely dead, was not popular. I can't think of any current actual examples, but um, anyway, they buried his whole palace deep under the earth. Uh, and it wasn't discovered until the late 15th century. Um, and when they discovered it, it was of course like a grotto, they had to go in above uh, and they went in and they found uh, large rooms, just like caves. Um, uh, uh, and grotto is the Italian I'm sure for a cave. So the, the, the style has been called grotesque. Uh, 
Um, this is the sort of thing that is impressive. So you see the fantastic uh, human person, but attached to foliage and, and so on, uh, and vases. And this style uh, being very old and new uh, was very attractive to people. Uh, and this is from Nicoletta de Medina. This is a, um, uh, I, I think it's probably a very fine woodcut, or it could be an etching. And once again, you see it is quite sort of symmetrical, um, not completely symmetrical, sort of mirror images of, of each other. Um, and this was very early 16th century, but it spread pretty rapidly through the low, through Germany and the Low Countries uh, to to England. Now, when you see or when I see something like like this, which has got okay clearly decorative elements as a frieze at the top, but then it's got figures gazing at you uh, and strange bits and pieces. I mean, it does beg the question: What does it mean? Um, I hope to convince you that's a legitimate question and also a question which uh, can legitimately be answered. Uh, so we'll start uh, with uh, the uh, naked winged figure um, uh, here um, and um, uh, an attractive little guy, I think he is altogether. Um, but when I first went to uh, on the open day, uh, it was suggested that this uh, this guy and this uh, marine creature here represented uh, a uh, a mermaid. Now I point out and emphasise this was not the settled view of the Charterhouse Association, uh, but they said, well, it's very like this mermaid-like figure in Harvington Hall. Mm. I, um, I I whispered to my wife, I, I don't believe a word of it, um, and I thought, well, it's all very well standing at the back of the crowd you know, muttering that you don't believe a word of it but on the other hand you know can you do any better just tell me what you think it is um and it was that that got me thinking it was me not uh, believing what i was told but then feeling was all very well being superior but uh, perhaps you should get on and find out what it is so when you see wing figures on fish what immediately comes to mind or does in the, in the book essentially is saint raphael um, this is from the book of Tobias, and it's a very long and involved story uh, involving somebody going blind and bits of fish, and I, I'm afraid it's, it's all in Tobias and the Angel, I can't go through it. Um, uh, and for a, a, a moment, I, I actually thought this was the explanation. And then I looked back at, at our guy here, and I thought, well, you know, on the left we have a serious figure with big wings, uh, fully dressed, carrying, you know, possibly a message from God and admittedly standing on a fish, which is a bit odd. Uh, and on the right here, we've got a naked person uh, whose modesty is only just covered by uh, a, a, the chance of having a sway of the fabric about him. And in addition, um, he's got wings indeed. Uh, he's got, I think, uh, what could be described as a cheeky expression uh, and, and a sort of Roman classical haircut. Uh, and it didn't really fit to me with being an emissary of heaven at all. Uh, I thought there must be another explanation. Uh, and another explanation did, did come to mind. Um, and uh, on the hunt for uh, a, a good example, I was in the Victoria and Albert Museum, and there is an exactly contemporary cloth um, embroidery uh, where you see this figure. Uh, whose nakedness, wings, uh, haircut, and uh, slightly insouciant uh, expression all seem to match up quite well with our guy. And in addition, um, has got a bow and arrow, which immediately makes you think uh, that these two people are the same uh, and that uh, they are Cupid. And if uh, our guy's left hand had been preserved, then maybe it might have had a bow and an arrow in it. Um, uh, and then we come to, well, what is he doing standing on a fish? Um, but it occurred to me after a while, there's the fact that you can't actually see the head of this creature. And that is much more likely that it is in fact a dolphin. Um, uh, and they represented uh, dolphins as fish uh, for a very long time. I mean, you can still see it um, you know, on the banks of the Thames. Uh, there's, you know, heads of dolphins up against the lampposts, and then the rest of it is all fishy. So I'm fairly convinced 
uh, on this evidence, uh, putting it all together. Um, and I'm sorry about the absence of the uh, uh, of the left hand and the possible weapons in it, but that this is nevertheless is Cupid. So an identifiable figure. And then we come on to the next figure, um, uh, who is, um, I mean, he's a handsome guy and he's got, you know, Renaissance shields and all the rest of it. And he, unlike most of the decoration, has clearly come out of a woodcut. I mean, we can see here the uh, typical sort of woodcut um, uh, marks being made, which have been reproduced by the person copying it. Uh, and everyone who's looked at this has said, well, we don't know who he is, but he must have a significance for the owner. You don't just put somebody who is sort of possible, would then have been completely identifiable on your wall without it being significant. Um, and if you look around at your own pictures, I look at uh, what Vincent's got behind him and that's significant for him. Uh, and uh, anybody else will have their books and their, and their pictures and so on. And what you hang on your wall is significant to you. Uh, the other comment that was made is that the style of presentation or representation was of one of the nine worthies. Now I read that and thought I actually know nothing about the nine worthies. Uh, so while his identification as, an, as one of the nine worthies is not crucial, I thought we could just take a little perhaps slightly sideways move into the nine worthies and explain a little bit about them. So these are the nine worthies uh, in 3D form uh, in Cologne Cathedral. And the nine worthies uh, uh, are, um, as the name implies, very worthy, heroic uh, uh, guys, uh, all guys, but I can assure feminists that there are nine lady worthies as well, represented in paintings, uh, I think in Amersham. Um, so they're not left out. So even in the uh, 14th century and so on, they, they had equal opportunities for being a worthy. Um, and it's a bit like the top 10 now, top 10 everything. These were the, the nine top guys in their culture at the time. And they divided into three, three threes, a uh, bit of a magic number. So there were Jewish Old Testament ones, King David, Joshua, and Judas Maccabeus. Uh, and uh, then, um, well, I, I, I now have my crib. <laughs> Uh, completely covered by a picture of, that's better, of Vincent. So we have Hector, Alexander, uh, and Julius Caesar. So these were classical heroes, all military men of one sort or another. Uh, and then uh, the Christians, um, uh, King Arthur, uh, Charlemagne, uh, Emperor Charlemagne, and Godfrey de Bouillon. And if you haven't heard of him, neither had I, and we'll talk him about, about him a little bit later on. Um, so the question really is, uh, which one of this lot might he be if he is a nine worthy, one of the nine worthies? Um, uh, I, I think you can probably discount Charlemagne on the grounds that being the first Holy Roman Emperor was unlikely to be the sort of person you pick up, put on the wall of a Protestant uh, landowner. Uh, so you're left with, with the two others. Um, uh, Arthur. Um, so I, I am having difficulty because I've got this, the, these thumbnails all over the place, which I really wanted to get rid of. Uh, so, the, the, so of these worthies, uh, which one would be significant and what, um, uh, I think maybe, no, I'm just trying to get rid of it. Oh yes. Um, uh, what are the criteria you would use to say that somebody was significant? Uh, and bearing in mind what I've said, I think, you know, they, they'd have to be heroic. Uh, they would, and now, oh, now frozen. Ah, technology. I have to reinstate the pictures, uh, I think, in order to get my, yeah. Apologies for this. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, tricky. Um, I'm just wondering if I was saw. No, it's just suddenly stopped. Here. I'm screen sharing. Hmm. This so was I was a little frightened of happening. Um, can you? You can all see that. Can uh, John? Can you? Can you? Can you see? Uh, my screen at all? Yes. 
Right. Okay. I just have to move it around, but uh, I'm I'm having difficulty advancing. Oh, there we are. Slide. It just seems to pause. Anyway, so you'd have to be her heroic, romantic, devout. I think you know for a Protestant, uh, uh, nice if you as defender of the realm, in the sense that Elizabethan um, uh, society was being uh, assaulted from uh, within and without, uh, and somebody who could be notionally thought to defend the realm would be good. Uh, and acceptable to all the Protestants. Um, so we've discounted Charlemagne. Uh, so what about Arthur? Um, well, King Arthur was obviously uh, 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 very important. Um, and you can see here, um, this is Le Artus, this is from 15th century uh, French um, uh, illuminated manuscript. So King Arthur uh, was indeed very important to the Tudors. Um, uh, and of course, Henry the Seventh uh, named his son uh, Arthur in the hope that if he were king, he'd unify the the, the Welsh and the English. Uh, so that Elizabeth uncle was, was called Arthur, but he wasn't really very acceptable to the Protestants because I mean, fundamentally, there's just far too much uh, extramarital sex going on uh, in the in the myths uh, and the legends. Uh, so he essentially was out. What then of Godfrey de Bouillon? Uh, so Godfrey de Bouillon, um, and here he is, a uh, fine looking guy. Uh, these are the crosses of Jerusalem. Uh, and these, which he seemed to wear in his hat, uh, are the symbols of the passion, the whip and the crown of thorns and the crucifix and all the rest of it. Um, so he was said to be the first king of Jerusalem. He, he wasn't actually, he was the first Western ruler of Jerusalem and it was, his successor, who was the first king. Um, but as you've never heard of him, and, uh, and so he had little universal appeal at all. Um, uh, and because of this, uh, if you wanted nine uh, worthies, they tended to replace him with a local one. Uh, so in Scotland, he was replaced by Robert the Bruce. Uh, so who are we going to have in England as our uh, worthy? Uh, and uh, uh, this was a quite long standing, and uh, in England he was replaced by Guy, Earl of Warwick. Um, and here we see this guy riding his destrie uh, with what I presume is one of the boars uh, that he, he, he slew. Um, he, he did a lot of slaying, he even slew a dragon in Northumberland. I've yet to discover which one it was, uh, but it'd be worthwhile finding out. Uh, so he got about the place a bit, well, quite a lot. Uh, and he also uh, slew the dun cow uh, on Dunsmoor Heath. And there's, you know, statues of him around the place and bits in Coventry and so on. Uh, and he was very, very popular. The ballads about him were sung at weddings and all the rest of it. So, you know, would he do? Um, question expected the answer, yes, of course. So this is Sagai uh, uh, in another rather beautifully illuminated manuscript. Um, and Sakai was, uh, and many of you will know this, but I'll say it for me as much as for anybody else. So he was the son of the steward of uh, Warwick Castle, i.e. not noble, but in and about. But he fell in love with noble Phyllis, Phyllis, uh, uh, it means happiness, um, uh, who was the, the Countess of Warwick. So clearly a cut above him. And she was a bit relac reluctant to uh, accept him. So he had to prove himself. So way back whenever the ballads and songs were being made, the way you proved yourself was basically to have a gap year uh, and go and slaughter people um, and things. So he gets off a slaughtering abroad. And he returns, and he returns at a, at a crucial time uh, when the Danes are invading England. Uh, and this, therefore, is presumably Athelstan, uh, who needs his help. And I'm not quite sure who he is, whether he's a, a, a prince bishop or, or whatever. Uh, but anyway, he, uh, uh, <clears throat> Sir Guy, uh, uh, kills Colbrand, saves the kingdom, and lo and behold, Phyllis loves him. So everyone say, ah, and then he suddenly finds himself utterly remorseful about all the carnage that he's made. He's killed animals, he's killed people. I mean, what can you do? So 
he's now got his woman, but he goes on pilgrimage. So, you know, that, that's, that's great. He then now leaves, goes on pilgrimage, uh, and later on returns incognito um, uh, and becomes a hermit in uh, Guy's Cliff, where he's tended beautifully by his um, wife, but she doesn't know it's him until he does declare himself to her on his deathbed. Uh, so, I mean, that's really sort of not a dry eye in the house type of stuff. So full of drama, um, but clearly a, a worthy man, even if we might think he was a little misguided from time to time. So would Sagai be significant and, ava and available, as it were, for Robert Dudley to consider suitable for his war? Was he heroic? Well, yeah, he slew the dung cow and other things. Romantic? Oh, yeah, fell in love with Phyllis. Devout? Pilgrim? And the Herbert, you can't top that. Defender of the realm, slew Colbrand, an invading Dane, and acceptable to Protestants. Curiously enough, the worthies were seen as defenders of Protestantism because they were never venerated like saints and so on. So they sort of preceded what they see as, as the uh, Roman Catholicism getting out of hand, as it were. So I think we can say that, 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 he, that he would be. Um, I think, sorry, just to go back, it's worthwhile pointing out uh, that, and if I don't mention it later, I should do it now, is that Robert Dudley felt that probably uh, Sagai was one of his ancestors. Uh, uh, and you can see why you might think that. Um, and he managed to arrange for various uh, lineages uh, to be drawn up, indicating that he was directly descended from Sagai as being his first ancestor. Um, but a couple of other things I'd like to point out. So um, here we have a pilgrim shell on that decorated column, cockle shell. They occur in the eastern shores of the Mediterranean, uh, and it shows you've been there. I know we associate them with Compostela, but that was only after the fall of Jerusalem. So it's a symbol of pilgrimage. So I interpret this bit as meaning that Cupid, whose love links a guy to pilgrimage, and he goes, he goes on pilgrimage for love. Uh, and up here you have um, a pretty nasty looking uh, guy uh, with uh, a, a banus. Um, it is just a head and it doesn't have to be severed, but certainly is in my imagination. He's got a large mouth and a banus, and I suspect that he represents um, Amaranth, uh, a giant who lived outside uh, Jerusalem and was slain by Sagai. So Cupid, love again, links a guy to pilgrimage and to daring deeds. So I think that kind of links this up quite nicely, the presence of these symbols. <coughs> uh, so here we are, Sir Guy of Warwick, uh, but also possibly uh, Robert Dudley, <coughs> masquerading as Sir Guy, or in, in the form of Sir Guy. Uh, and so he, he's, representing himself and drawing down all these virtues, um, which is entirely compatible with his, with his self-image. Uh, and are there any other clues as to why that is definitely Sagai and or Robert? Well, um, when you look at this, this beastie, this hippocam, I mean, the thing that strikes you, uh, as it did John Plumley, the head of the, the Charterhouse Association, is that this bit here is done in a very different style from this bit here. Uh, and all this curious shape of a horse's mouth and, and so on is all done essentially to show that he's holding uh, uh, some, um, some oak leaves. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, and so this means that this bit of the painting has been learned specially to show that. Um, the whole of the decoration comes from continental pattern books or stencils, um, but it's very unlikely that they could have found one uh, which represented a hippocamp uh, with some oak leaves in its teeth. So this means this is very special uh, and um, uh, that it has a special significance. But the oak leaves are indeed significant uh, because they represent uh, Robert Dudley. So when he was in the tower with his father and his older brother who were both executed, um, they all carved 
uh, in vitro uh, representations, things that represented themselves. So here you see um, the, the oak leaves, uh, and over here, I presume this is sort of two bears and a ragged staff, and there are the acorns, and these are the gilly flowers, um, uh, and all the different members of, of the family. Uh, and it's said that he chose uh, oak leaves because robur uh, is the Latin um, for oak, uh, and is the same uh, as Robert, essentially, or Robert. But in addition to that, we have down at the bottom uh, this very prominent um, uh, white rose emerging from a cornucopia. And I think we can say that it is special because it's completely surrounded by blackness uh, and there really is no other reason uh, for it being there other than to draw attention to it. And I desperately wanted this to be a Tudor rose, but it clearly isn't. Uh, and um, uh, it's been pointed out to us that, that uh, Elizabeth's flower was the rose, uh, and when she had a white one, it was for York and Purity. And when she had a red one, uh, it was for Lancaster and Love. Uh, and Elizabeth Goldring, uh, professor uh, who knows about some of these things uh, and specializes in paintings in Elizabethan time, pointed out uh, that there is this uh, portrait, the Hamden portrait of Elizabeth, um, uh, done about 1560. Um, uh, in which she holds a red rose uh, and it's surrounded by oak leaves and the rest of the painting uh, she has um, got a um, carnation in her hand. Uh, the carnation was a symbol of uh, marriage, uh, engagement um, uh, and I like to think of this painting as a sort of Elizabethan tinder, you know, swipe right if you want me. Uh, but it also says basically that I may be available for marriage, uh, but here on my shoulder is my love, my the, the red rose uh, for love, but surrounded by oak leaves. So I may get married, but my heart will always belong to Dudley. And I'm sure that that is what that, um, I can't think of any other interpretation essentially of that particular painting. Uh, so can we now, gather up Sir Guy and Phyllis and the winged figure um, uh, with some more backing other than the conjectures I've given you. But in fact, if you look into the history of Sir Guy's, and Sir Guy and many were written, uh, this is from Gamma Girton. Uh, it says, so Cupid sent from his bow a golden headed shaft and wounded Phyllis and to her sight presented an armed knight saying, this knight shall become so famous in the world that kings and princes shall his friendship court. Uh, and that, of course, is Sir Guy. So here we can link Guy, Phyllis, and the winged figure. And if you're not convinced about the whole um, Cupid thing, then there's an alternative version, which has an angel appearing to Phyllis uh, and uh, saying, basically, you, you, you've got to love him. Uh, so I think that that sort of wraps these uh, three figures uh, uh, together rather nicely. Um, so then we come back to, well, having said all that, what does it all mean? Um, well, it, it is, of course, all about Elizabeth uh, and Dudley. Uh, and they, of course, go back a long way. They were childhood sweethearts. Um, uh, they were both in the tower on the orders of Mary at the same time. Uh, they both had uh, executed parents. Um, I mean, they had a lot in common. And Dudley was her favorite and she made him master of horse. Now, Master of Horse sounds like, you know, you can supervise in the stables, but in fact, this wasn't the case. Master of Horse was the person who was allowed uh, to uh, look after the Queen's horse and help Her Majesty onto it, i.e. he had carte blanche to put his hand on her bum and give her a bunk up. So it's very intimate uh, and not something you give just to anyone. And Dudley was always very keen to impress her when I mean, she had all these visits to Kenilworth uh, and she visited the area often both before and after the decoration. Uh, and houses were often especially done up for royal progression, uh, as we saw uh, uh, previously uh, in, in the talk. Uh, so uh, my interpretation, if I can unobscure my, there we are, it, it is that the painting is saying that Dudley is as worthy of Elizabeth's love as the guy was of Phyllis's. So that's, that's the sort of end result of 
looking at the painting. That's my interpretation. I, mean, I still think there's a bit of a problem in the sense of uh, this magnificent ruin is in Kenilworth Castle, and it's the bit that Dudley put up just for one visit for Elizabeth. Um, uh, and we're talking about a painting on a partition wall in the Charter House. Uh, so I, I don't think I've worked out who the painting was supposed to impress, but I don't think that um, Elizabeth was going back to, to up the stairs and round the corner to look at it. So I feel that the direction, who was being impressed by it or persuaded, I, I don't know. Um, uh, but that really is about as far as I can get at the moment. So that essentially concludes the, uh, the first part of the talk. Um, and I'm now going to move on to the inscription, which you see there uh, uh, at the left top. Uh, and I'm just moving around these really irritating little thumbnails. Uh, there we are. Uh, and I hope I'm, it's going to be able to move on and back. So uh, the ignorance of the scripture is the ignorance of God. And I looked at that and thought, well, I, I don't know there's going to get much out of this. Uh, and all I can say is, well, I, I was proved wrong. Um, so this looks to be um, the ignorance of scripture is the ignorance of God, a quote um, from St. Jerome's prologue to the commentary on Isaiah. Um, and normally it's attributed to this, which is ignoratio uh, scripturarum, ignoratio Christi est. Um, uh, and we know that um, uh, Sir Jerome uh, was a bit of a favourite of Protestants as a whole, uh, and Robert Dudley in particular. Um, uh, Saint Jerome translated the, the Bible from Hebrew and Greek into Latin, um, which was the, as well, the vulgar tongue of those who could read at all. So access, direct access to the scriptures is very important to Protestants um, without any intervening priest in the way. And he also wrote commentaries as well, uh, and that was one of them. As uh, I said, Dudley had a picture of him in Kenilworth Castle. Doubt if it was that one, uh, but it might have might have been uh, a print. It's it's annotated in in the list of his his effects, and I think it's striking that that he did have a picture of him. Um, there's some oddities about it, um, in the sense that the S here uh, of ignorance of, of the scriptures has been added later, um, uh, and you can see there's really a rather a different. Um, uh, type of uh, letter S from the one at the beginning, um, uh, which is uh, interesting. So they're sort of correcting some error, and it's a bit similar, a bit similar with of God, um, uh, because the usual um, interpretation, the usual quote is uh, of Christ. Um, uh, and if you look, you can see God's in a bit of a darker paint, as if it was a bit sort of they corrected it later, and then off to the right. There's what looks like a possible letter there, but couldn't make any letter fit that shape. Um, uh, uh, and I couldn't make any word uh, chime with it. Um, so it's possibly just a decorative placeholder, um, part of which has gone missing. Uh, and so I don't think there's any deep significance there. Um, but you do wonder uh, why they changed it, and why they didn't have it um, as it is normally written. Uh, and there didn't appear to be any religious reasons, but in fact, in the preceding sentence before the one I've just quoted, um, it does say, um, this is St. Jerome, um, qui nescit scripturas nescit dei. So I think, you know, there's obviously a bit of confusion as to which bit they're actually quoting. Uh, now there's another layer to this, uh, which I thought was, was interesting, um, is that uh, John Wycliffe comes into it a bit because he wrote presumably echoing St. Jerome, something very similar, uh, which is to be ignorant of the scriptures is to be ignorant of Christ. Um, oh, Damocle is the same as to me. Uh, and he wrote that in on the truthfulness of Holy Scripture. Uh, now, uh, Wycliffe was uh, uh, very important to the uh, Protestants because like St. Jerome, he translated parts of the Bible, but into English. Um, into Middle English at the same time as Pierce Plowman and, and, and so on. But he was very, very, very anti-monk. Uh, and he demanded that the church be stripped of excessive property. 
Now you can see if you're uh, Robert Dudley uh, sitting in the Charter House uh, with everything going derelict around him, building uh, it up and uh, monks wandering the, 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 the countryside uh, begging, you can see that this sort of um, background would, would, would appeal essentially. Uh, so this seems to demonstrate, I am Robert Dudley, I am very Protestant. Um, I'm referring to St. Jerome, but in English, I would like to point out, and also I have the backing of Wycliffe, who is justifying my use of former church property uh, as, as a house or weekend cottage or whatever. And the other thing to point out is that we just read that quite easily. It's nice, but the lettering is Roman and not black letter. And that is, uh, although I've had a bit of a to and fro with some of the reviewers, um, I think it is it's extraordinary. It's very, very unusual. Um, and because we read it so easily, we don't appreciate how unusual that is. Um, this is what the other um, uh, inscription looks like. And this is what they all look like at that in, in this era. Um, I've had a crack at this, and I think it's something like um, Amen. So the diacritic mark there means there's something missing. So I think it's Amen, virtue, so be his fame, or something like that. But that's not really the point. It's, it's darn difficult to read. Uh, uh, and it's and it's what everything was, was written in. Um, uh, uh, so then it leads you to, well, what is this script that is being used? Um, and I draw your attention to uh, a number of features. So we start over with the T here. Uh, these are called wedge uh, or spur serifs. We know about serif and sans serif. Um, and you see that the, the spurs go up. And this, this is a particular uh, font, printer's font. See, it goes up. Um, and uh, then with the P here, this doesn't quite meet the ascender. And up here, I don't know if I'm pointing at it because it's behind, behind Vincent, um, um, uh, doesn't meet uh, and so on. You can go through it. And then some of them are a bit wild, but the H's are crossed both ways, opposed to just one way. Um, uh, so I think this is, this is an identifiable printer's script. That's what it is. And I identified as Garamond, um, uh, which was invented uh, or created in 1561. Uh, it's pretty imperfectly rendered. Um, I'll just pull down the, there we are. Um, uh, you can see that every now and again, uh, whoever does it, he goes completely wild with their, um, uh, with their serifs, excessively elaborate, um, uh, and uh, all looks a bit a bit wild. Um, and then there's one other thing, you see that the Vs are um, uh, equal uh, up and down, up and down. And of course the, the diacritic mark here means that you're supposed to pronounce it as a U. Um, uh, uh, but this one up here is, uh, is not, it's kind of back to front. So you can often see Vs which go down and then up, but you very rarely see one that's angled and up like that. Um, uh, so I think it's actually reversed, uh, which brings to mind the thought that this was, if it's a printer's script, printer's typeface, it was actually then written by a printer. Um, and there are other, I won't go into the diacritic mark business, but, but that also supports that contention. So this is called Garamond, 1510-1561, uh, prison punch cut. Cutter, he, his type was uh, then taken to the Low Countries after he died, 1561, and then came on to England. Um, uh, this is the first trace I can find uh, of anything which looks a bit Garamondish. Uh, it's just the, really the first capital letters of the first two lines um, uh, of this, uh, of, uh, uh, I'm trying to move my, you know, around a bit, um, 1565, that's right. So this is William Griffith, uh, and this is the Griffin. Um, so he had enough type to do the first two lines and this bit here, and then the rest he goes into black letter or italic. So there is some in England in 1565, but not much. And then we come over to uh, 1570, um, where this whole frontispiece is now probably pretty well in Garamond, um, uh, but then the rest, so this is black, uh, um, black letter, and then you can see looking through here, 
uh, on the reverse side, the rest of the whole book is in black letter. It was very modern, it was very striking. Uh, you, can, you can read it after all quite easily uh, uh, and, and very new and very modern. And John Day, uh, nice um, uh, etching of him here, uh, not quite, uh, it's probably a wood, very fine woodcut, I'm not sure. Uh, so the letters, as it were, don't count because they're created individually, they're not, they're not typed. Um, 1522 to 1584, he was the foremost printer of his day, especially the Bible uh, and other religious tracts. Um, and he was imprisoned in the tower at the same time as Dudley for printing Protestant tracts. So he's Protestant and he essentially uh, was very friendly with the Dudleys. Um, and Dudley's father, the one who was executed, the uh, Earl of Northumberland, um, uh, uh, had supported Day uh, uh, for quite some time. And Dudley, that's a R. Robert Dudley, um, uh, was recognized as Day's patron for 1560. I mean, in essence, they were in business together. Uh, and Day's most famous book was Fox's Book of Martyrs, um, and that was dedicated to Dudley. And sort of in return for that, Dudley tried to have um, uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs tried to have them placed in all the churches in England, which had been just as just an outrageous money spinner for Day uh, that it actually didn't get through. Um, but you can see they were essentially hand in glove. So the point I'm really making is that if there was any printer involved, it was going to be John Day. So the uh, um, inscription is in uh, a, a printer's typeface, convinced of that. Garamond at this time was very rare in England, so probably nobody else had it. Um, and Day was possibly the only printer uh, with enough, uh, and even he could only produce uh, a Frenchess piece. But it was very modern and very you know, up to date, cutting edge stuff. But if you then go back to the choice of the texts, essentially, it's an advert for days where if you say ignorance of the scriptures is ignorance of Christ, then it means go out and buy a Bible, please. Oh, and one of mine. That would be excellent. Thank you, sir. I'll have three shillings or whatever. Um, uh, and they had a monopoly on many religious books. Uh, so I think, I mean, in many ways, you think how, how pure and how. How, how righteous and then, oh, how mercenary. Um, and the errors in the rendition, I would suggest, are the printer writing um, uh, on the wall or painting on the wall. I mean, there's the reverse V, uh, and then the, I didn't go into the diacritic marks because it's, it's a bit fancy and a bit small and probably a bit, a bit tedious if you're not totally immersed in it. Um, the day himself um, uh, would have been far too busy in that period uh, 1569, 1572, to come out from London to Coventry to do it himself, because he was preparing the second edition. And while I would absolutely hate to read, uh, it is uh, Fox Book of Martyrs is a huge tome uh, I've, I've seen, and it's full of horrible pictures of people being burnt alive uh, uh, and so on. But it required an enormous amount of work in the printing uh, and in the pictures and so on, and he supervised all that himself. So the implication really is that it had to be one of his team and it had to be somebody he could trust. So in other words, a senior apprentice. And I thought probably that was about as far as I could get. And then I came across this, uh, ah, not quite this, not quite there yet. Uh, uh, well, just looking into how you might access who they were. Um, uh, all printers were, were controlled by the stationers company. And they recorded the apprentices. When you got an apprentice, you went to the stationer's company and I, I've been to, to the stationer's company. I've looked at the, um, at, at the records there. Very, very helpful young lady uh, showed me you know, where to look and so on. Um, and they're available from 1576, i.e. really too late. Uh, and I've looked through them just in case. And there's nobody really who seemed likely because um, it sometimes says where they're from and so on. Um, and John Day's first recorded apprentice was in 1578. But there is this poem called Beware the Cat by a guy called William Baldwin in 1570. It had a village of chequered history. It was sort of written early and then banned and then there were various editions, but sort of 1570 was when most of it came along. Uh, and in it, he describes a scene in the Aldersgate house where the apprentices lived with John Day 
um, and he describes uh, an unnamed, sadly unnamed man from Staffordshire, Staffordshire. Uh, and according to what was going on in 1570 and all the rest of it, he was probably taken on about 10 years before in 1561-1562. So he'd be coming to the end of his, his, his tenure as an apprentice uh, in 1569-1572. So if Dudley wanted the latest type of lettering uh, and he knew a printer, the only person he would know, uh, you know that well would be John Day. And John Day would likely to oblige, but Sam, frankly, sorry, got this other big project on which you know, you're involved too, but I can send an apprentice. Well, I think the one from Staffordshire would be the right one, wouldn't it? You know, so there you are, there's London, there's Staffordshire and uh, three quarters plus of the way up. Uh, is commentary, slap on the line. So my contention is that probably this unnamed man from Staffordshire was the one who wrote the text uh, and that the uh, inscription essentially proclaims Dudley's Protestantism. Uh, it references St. Jerome and Wycliffe um, as being proper Protestant people you could, or approved by Protestants that you could uh, uh, mention without uh, censure. Uh, that it essentially advertises John Day's wares as well. And it was written by someone from John Day's team, uh, probably the apprentice from Staffordshire. Thank you. Right, um, uh, James is prepared to answer questions. So um, I think the best thing we can do is either put your thumb up, um, I think it's reactions, or put it in the chat. Um, you've got a question and we'll take them in order. Uh, Vince, do you have a question to start us with? You're muted. <laughs> Not a question, uh, not a question, James. I'm, uh, I'm just a bit gobsmacked. Uh, are, are you related to Monsieur Poirot in any way? <laughs> no, but uh, I love stories. I do quite a lot of writing of stories, and I think unraveling mysteries uh, is great. And my son's tutor, uh, uh, so one of my sons uh, is is now a GP, um, uh, but his tutor was actually an art historian. He said. Doctors make very good art historians because they notice things. So I suppose it's, it's the combination of noticing and always asking another question. Well, uh, thank you very much. I mean, I, 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 I honestly can't think of a question to ask. The amount of detail there uh, and the story itself, it was just completely, uh, it just completely had me, had me wrapped up. I, I, want, uh, I, I want to see the next episode. <laughs> well, yeah. I want to binge on the box help. set. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you Is there another question? Peter, Peter Walters. Peter Walters. You'll have to unmute yourself. Or I might be on here. Hope you can hear me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely fascinating talk. Um I think you said Dudley sold the Charter House in 1572. So, so he only, only owned it for three years. Yeah. Um, do, do we know why he sold it? I, mean, it? I would love to know if he sold it at the time that he knew that Elizabeth was coming to Kenilworth. But I've inquired and nobody seems to know exactly when. Sadly. Uh, because, it, I mean, it doesn't really matter, but the story will be slightly different if he sold it after she'd come to Kenilworth and gone home, um, uh, or if he said, oh, well, she's never coming, uh, I'm going to sell it. Uh, but, but whether really he thought that she would go to the Charter House, even to have a look around, I don't know. John um, Plummer is fairly convinced that she would, but I'm not sure. I mean, she was fated so much uh, uh, and uh, in Kenilworth. Um, and also Dudley was very... Um, disapproving of the um, quality of, of, of where she was put up when she stayed in Whitefriars 
uh, I think in uh, 1565 or thereabouts, in John Hale's house. Okay, uh, Carol. Hi, thank you very much. Um, James, thank you. That was just fascinating. Um, I'm from Historic Commentary Trust and it was oh. just a marvel to, to hear that painting um, unraveled. So I've got a really cheeky question for you. Mm -hmm. um, we, we have um, Creative Core and Jim Parkins on the call today uh, working on our interpretation. And we're just about to try and recruit a specialist panel of experts to help us make sure that we get the text right. And I was wondering if you would be willing to be on that specialist panel. Uh, I, I would be delighted, but my knowledge is highly, you know, blinkered. It, it, it's, you know, <laughs> down there. I, I also, um, but be warned, I do like editing texts. <laughs> I have a great you have pencil. something in common then. <laughs> Well, I, I will look forward to hearing from you, Carol. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Gaynor. Uh, first time I've been with the Coventry Society. Very interesting talk. Uh, has anything been done to preserve the painting? Oh, um, in fact, um, one of the things I thought about uh, when I first looked at it was I was surprised that nobody else had gone into thinking about what it meant. But to be honest, the Coventry, the, sorry, the Charterhouse Association has spent most of its life just trying to preserve the place. So it has stuck on it all sorts of uh, damp, uh, on its face, damp meters and all sorts of things. Um, and of course, it is just undergoing the Charterhouse a major renovation. Um, and one of, so yeah, the answer is yes. Um, but I did like to know what's under the coat of arms. Um, and I had, with bits and pieces of paper, reconstructed what might be in the missing white bit, um, uh, it, putting in the bow and arrow of Cupid and so on. Uh, and apparently they'd already sort of thought of that and are hoping to have a projection where they can project onto it, which is not quite answering your question. But the answer is, it is upmost, uppermost in their mind. Carol, do you want to... Carol, do you want to add anything to that answer? Yeah, thank you very much. We have actually commissioned um, Perry Lithgow um, to do some conservation work on the painting. So they will be doing really light touch conservation. And actually, James, I don't know if you've seen the reports that they've done, but I'd be happy to share them because it strikes me that some of the some of the unusual bits might come from later repaintings over the original to try and restore it and one of the things that they might pick up is sort of what, what the layers are and which bits are genuinely original and which bits are later. Yeah uh, uh, so I have read some of their uh, I think they've got two reports so I don't know of a subsequent one uh, and of course you, you can um, uh, detect quite a bit of that simply by going up with a hand lens. Um, but unfortunately, ever since whenever, um, autumn of the year before last, um, uh, it, it's, well, it's, not, it's unfortunate for me, I couldn't be able to get in, uh, but it's of course fortunate for the Charterhouse that a significant amount of money has been spent on preserving it and opening it to the public. And in general, it's kind of a, it's, it, 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 it's, a, it's a good thing. Um, uh, and if they've got more stuff to add, I would be very interested. Another question? Is Paul. Paul. Uh, well done, James. Really good insight into um, a piece of artwork that you would um, normally sort of just walk past. Uh, I've been in involved with the Charterhouse right from the very beginning and when I first was asked to do some guided tours, it was very difficult to talk about that room. It's very striking and I just wondered, would they have painted the whole room in the same design? Because it's like a replacement for wallpaper. Uh, one of the things is that, one of the first things as a, as a Charterhouse Association was that we bought blinds to put on the windows because it was, the sun was bleaching the painting closer to the window. And if you look at it, you can actually see pencil drawing where someone said, and it's got a date and the name of the people um, before they actually decorated over it. So at one time it must have been had wallpaper over it and like someone had just left their mark sort of type thing. Um, and it's also interesting that because they've put doors and 
corridors and, and then chain, <laughs> boarded up the, the doors and then put in other doors. So it, was, it was classed as sort of like um, nondescript. It's a bit like nowadays, you'd scrape the wallpaper off, but then they just knock walls through it. It is interesting how it, as to interpret that space is, and like you say, uh, projection or a representation would be very difficult. And uh, I'd like to be involved in the team that do the um, interpretation because there's most likely more than one interpretation. Um, and, and, you know, um, be interesting to do more, even more research. I think if we knew what was under the uh, Samson Baker coat of arms, uh, I would hope that it would uh, be some fantastic made up um, uh, coat of arms of the guy, or alternatively, uh, one of Leicester, um, uh, then that would sort of nail it. Um, but, um, you know, it's, it's a bit like in science, you know, the wonderful theory killed by the uh, insignificant but deadly fact. Uh, so there's a sort of element of, uh, of, of wanting to know and, and not wanting to know if it's not the right answer. <laughs> okay, uh, do we have more questions before we move on? Uh, uh, Eleanor, Eleanor down at the bottom, Eleanor. at least on my screen. Uh, I can see Janice and Graham if you'd like to ask next and I can't <laughs> see you. Oh, well, well, she's waiting. Helena, Helena Nesbitt's waiting. Been waiting oh, for great. I, oh, sorry. Yeah, you you can carry on, carry on, and we'll do, we'll do um, Helena. I just afterwards. wanted to say, James, I'm absolutely gobsmacked. That was the most interesting piece of information I've ever had on Coventry. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I, I shall accept my baptism as a as a Coventry <laughs> lad, prof kid, uh, with gratitude. Any Hello. books? Oh, Any yes. books? Oh, sorry? Any books? Uh, sorry, I, I can't, Have you uh, written any books? Uh, no, no. I've, I've had uh, um, short stories included in anthologies uh, and I've got quite a few stuff online. Uh, and, and yeah, yeah no, I mean, I'm, I am, as they say, a published author. <laughs> right. <laughs> including the Lancet thank and the you, BMJ, but that's another matter. Elena. Um, yes, and James is a, a very good poet as well. Um, I'm going to ask a question from complete ignorance, but I'm just struck by the fact that you mentioned Grisai and the, the painting is sort of black and white. And um, and I'm wondering, is this just to do with fashion or was it to do with economy? Um, why black and white? Um, well, in fact, a lot of them were black and white. Grisai was used largely uh, to represent um, statues. Um, so you're, you're, you're taking uh, a, a, um, a painted form to look like a sculpture. Um, uh, and uh, so that's what Grisai was used for. Um, uh, and so something that is actually black and white is, is not Grisai, where, where the moulding depends upon the darkening of the grey and the lightening of the grey and so on. Uh, so it's a different technique. Um, uh, and as I say, I was fairly well hauled over the coals, uh, and quite correctly so for ref referring it to uh, uh, as, as uh, Grisai. And um, the um, restorers, um, Perry, I can't remember their, their name that Carol mentioned, um, uh, they are going to be taken to task by uh, and Dr. Andrea Kirkham uh, because, because they have misled me. <laughs> But was there some sort of reaction against colour or was colour a reaction against black and white in the decoration of rooms? Um, I think Grisai originally w w was, um, I can't afford a statue, but I can have a Tempe Loi uh, Grisai painting. I think it was that because as you saw in um, what's it out, I can never remember uh, the, the, the one, but, but uh, colour uh, added to the black and white was not uncommon. Um, it was perfectly acceptable. And if you think of the Elizabethans, they were um, Protestant or not, uh, they were quite happy to be very, very lavish in colour. Okay. Um, I think we'll uh, call a halt there. And Vince will now uh, do the vote of thanks and give the society update, tell you about the next meeting. Okay, well, I, I think it goes without saying that we're all rather 
rather gobsmacked by that presentation. So thank you very much, James. And uh, uh, let's book you when you come to uh, part two, hey? <laughs>